Uh, good day, scholars. Welcome back. Uh, today we are going over a, a new uh, standard. Uh, today we will be talking about Unit 2, um, the American Revolution. And the essential question for this uh, particular unit is what are the economic, political, and social factors that led to the American Revolution? Uh, the standard we are covering today is social studies, U.S. history, uh, standard number three, and that is analyze the causes of the American Revolution. Uh, we are also covering SSUSH4, which is also social studies, United States history, uh, standard number four. Uh, analyze the ideological, military, social, and diplomatic aspect of the American Revolution. Um, first, we start with the French and Indian War. Uh, the French and Indian War was also known as the Seven Years War, uh, was a result of a long rival and conflict uh, between Great Britain and France over the competition uh, for territory in North America. Uh, with a solid history of trading partnerships, Native Americans fought the French. Uh, Great Britain secured help from the American colonists who were eager to take control of more territory as they continued to expand. Treaty of Paris, the Treaty of 1763 officially ended the French and Indian War. Uh, and the Great Britain and the colon uh, colonies defeated France. As a result of the Treaty of 1763, the British received Canada uh, from France and Florida from Spain, but permitted France to keep its West Indian sugar islands and gave Louisiana to Spain. Uh, the treaty strengthened the American colonies significantly by removing their European rivals to the north and south and opening the Mississippi Valley to westward expansion. The treaty gave the Britain, excuse me, the treaty gave the British government more control over colonies. The colonies objected to the loss of control over their own affairs. And some Americans begin to think about an American revolution. Um, here you can see um, the before and after uh, picture of what uh, the territory of America was uh, during that time. Uh, as you can see, France had a much bigger state in, in America. But after the French and Indian War, uh, you can see that Spain uh, took over a great deal, as well as uh, Great Britain uh, moved a little bit further west, as you can see. Uh, in this picture, you can see on the left that the colonies pretty much stopped, uh, stopped at Georgia. Uh, but in the right, you can see that it expanded westward uh, toward, uh, it looks as though what Mississippi, a part of Tennessee, Ohio, uh, maybe a little bit of Missouri, definitely Michigan. Uh, moving forward. Uh, end of salutary neglect, the proclamation of 1763. Uh, the proclamation of 1763 significant, uh, signified, excuse me, the end of the British period of salutary neglect. Tensions increased because the proclamation of 1763 forbade, uh, which didn't allow, uh, colonists to settle west of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, the reason for the proclamation of 1763 was to limit colonists' conflict with Native Americans, as well as to keep colonists in designated areas to allow the government to gain much needed revenue. 
End of salutary neglect. Um, continue. Uh, tensions also grew when Parliament passed laws to tax the colonists to pay for the cost of keeping a large standing army in North America that would protect both Britain's possession and the American colonists from attacks. Um, colonists were increasingly angry for being subjected to taxation without representation. That's a big point, taxation without representation. Uh, Great Britain forced them to pay taxes but did not allow them to have representation or vote in parliament. So basically, uh, it's like somebody uh, from the outside coming in and dictating to you what you can and cannot do. Uh, so it's not like that you have, uh, in our cases, whether it be an alderman, uh, uh, a state senator, a state uh, House of Representative, a Georgia House of Representative member. Uh, so basically they were just dictating policy to them so they were kind of helpless as to uh, the certain things that were going on uh, to them uh, by uh, Great Britain. Moving forward. Uh, colonial resistance, uh, British taxation and, colon and colonial response. Uh, the Stamp Act required the colonists to print newspaper, legal documents, playing cards and so forth on paper bearing special stamps, uh, similar, similar to uh, postage stamps. Buying the stamped paper was the equivalent of paying a tax. Uh, so basically, um, they issued out, they issued basically stamps to them and made them pay for the stamps to mail things off. So that was another form of taxation. Uh, the Intolerable Acts, uh, as close to the port of Boston as punishment uh, for the Boston Tea Party. These acts also allow British officials accused of major crime to be tried in England and force the colonists to house British troops on their own property. So basically British troops uh, came in and basically lived uh, with uh, the colonists. That's what it was permitting. And of course, that's, that's that's really truly an un that's unacceptable. How, who would any of us like to have a, an, a member of the army that we don't know uh, permitted to live and eat uh, in our homes or eat, you know, go in your refrigerator and eat out of your home? Oh, of course not. So these are some things that really um, ignited uh, the American Revolution that really kind of uh, made the colonists angry. Uh, colonial resistance. British taxation and colonial response. American uh, colonists opposed to British authority in Massachusetts formed a secret organization called the Sons of Liberty. Uh, to show their dislike of British rule, they damaged British property, including government offices and the home of wealthy supporters of the British. Uh, the Sons of Liberty organized the Boston Tea Party in which colonists threw British tea in the Boston Harbor to protest the Tea Act. Uh, the British punished the colonies for the Boston Tea Party by imposing um, the Intolerable Acts. Now here in the Intolerable Acts, um, the Daughters of Liberty joined the Sons of Liberty in protesting British rule in North America. Uh, they wove a uh, house spun fabric to make cloth and other goods so the colonists would not need to rely on British imports. Um, the Committee of Correspondence were the American colonies means for maintaining communication lines in the year before the Revolutionary War, the years before the Revolutionary War. Uh, the committees of correspondence encouraged colonial opposition against British taxation and established a political union among the 13 colonies. Um, the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Paine's Common Sense. Um, although most colonists were angry about British policies, only about one third of the colonists supported a war to gain independence from Great Britain. 
1776, patriot philosopher Thomas Paine published uh, Common Sense. Uh, this small pamphlet gave a big effect, uh, excuse me, had a big effect on colonists and encouraged uh, many uh, Americans to support independence uh, from Great Britain. Um, the Declaration of Independence is one of the most important documents in American history. Um, the signing of the Declaration of uh, the, the signing of the Declaration uh, it, it signal the official beginning of the American War, I mean, of the American Revolution. Uh, the Committee of Five were given the task of writing the document. Uh, Thomas Jefferson wrote the first draft, borrowing phrases from the influential writings of English philosopher uh, John Locke. The quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, uh, reflects John Locke's idea of natural rights. Uh, additionally, uh, John Locke also believed that the purpose of government was to protect the natural rights, that, and that when a government failed to protect those natural rights, then the government was breaking the social contract that existed between man and government. Under the social contract theory, people agree to obey the government as long as the government protects the natural rights. All right, that's where we get this idea of um, giving citizens the right to protest for rights or just to protest inhumane, inhumane uh, conditions. That's their protest to the government that they're not fairly um, being treated. So um, I know we see a lot of that right now, a lot of that right now, especially recently. Now, um, here's a chart of the strength and weak, uh, strengths of uh, uh, Britain and America, some of their strengths and their advantages. Um, with Britain, they had five, 50,000 uh, soldiers reinforced by uh, 30,000 um, Hussein, uh, Hussein mercenaries, as well as loyalists, uh, people who were loyal to the crown, um, Native Americans and African Americans. Uh, soldiers were well-trained and experienced uh, uh, compared to the Americans, and they were well supplied with food, uniform, and munitions and weapons. On the other side, America received secret aid from the French. Uh, Washington was an experienced, of course, that's George Washington, was an experienced uh, military leader who inspired change and confidence. Uh, some of the weaknesses. Um, Britain, uh, sending troops and supplies from Britain to America was slow and it was very costly. Um, as well as the British were not passionate about defeating the rebels and they had poor military leadership. Uh, on the other side, America uh, had a continental army, which was very small and short of soldiers. Uh, few were trained in battle and there were shortages of weapons, food, and supplies, as well as uniforms. Um, the Battle of the Re uh, American Revolution. Uh, Valley Forge, after uh, British victories, the Continental Army led by George Washington faced one of the most difficult trials at the Valley Forge. Uh, they suffered from starvation, disease, and lack of shelter, but under the leadership of General George Washington, they were able to remain together and receive valuable training. Uh, Baron von Sternburn, Sternburn helped to uh, train and drill soldiers and created confidence and discipline in throughout the colonist army. All right, the Battle of Saratoga. After American uh, victory at uh, Saratoga, France decided to support uh, through the signed military and economic treaties of Benjamin Franklin. Uh, France helped America win the war by sending its army and navy 
Uh, Benjamin Franklin and Marquis Lafayette of France negotiated the alliance between the American colonists and France. This was the turning point of the war because help from France was a leading cause of American victory over Great Britain. Um, as you can see here, we got a, um, a map of the turning point of the war. As you can see, the British uh, shoulders are coming down south from the north, and you can see that American forces are, are moving up that uh, would be, uh, it looks like um, New York, as you can see the Hudson River, um, and the series of battles. Um, as you can see, the first battle was on September the 9th. Uh, second battle was on October the 7th. So this just gives you a, a, a map of, or an, uh, a um, illustration of exactly where uh, and when uh, those wars were fought. Now, uh, here we were taking a look at uh, the next battle of the revolution, which was the Battle of Trenton. Um, here in this battle, they caught Hessians, which were fighters for the Britons, Britons by surprise after crossing uh, the icy Delaware River and took 868 prisoners, prisoners without losing a single man. Americans uh, caught another 300 British troops a week later at Princeton. Now, this victory proved that Washington Army uh, could fight as well as an experienced uh, European ar Army. So at this point, I think it became more evident to the Americans as well as uh, the Europeans that they could actually win this war. And as you can see here, um, you have a picture of Washington crossing the Delaware. Uh, this painting is an infamous painting. Um, it's very popular uh, among um, scholars in history, American history courses. But uh, as you can see, it's just a painting of that moment. Of course, this wasn't done in that moment. So I'm sure that moment didn't quite look at this. But of course, they romanticize uh, this event in the, um, in the painting of it. So as you can see, George Washington standing up, leaning forward, one, one knee up. So uh, like I said, a very romanticized uh, picture. All right, the next battle is the Battle of Yorktown. Uh, most British uh, were tired of war at this point. Um, General Cornwallis, Cornwallis uh, was um, the leader of British Army. He moved his troops uh, to Yorktown in order to gain supplies and keep a line of communication open by sea. Uh, the French Navy saddled up from the Caribbean to block supplies from reaching Cornwall Wallace uh, 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 army and to cut off his ability to escape by sea. With France's help, 16,000 troops uh, surrounded the British Navy and the British uh, ended up surrendering. The Battle of Yorktown. Um, this is a, uh, again, another map of it. As you can see, um, at this point, uh, Washington is coming from the south down to uh, from the north down to the south. And as you can see, uh, Yorktown is that uh, town right in that um, right just left of the tip of that peninsula. So uh, uh, in the Chesapeake Bay. All right. The end of the American Revolution. All right. The Treaty of Paris signed in September 1783. Uh, the, uh, the 1783 Treaty of Paris formally concluded uh, the American Revolution, Revolutionary War. Um, it recognized the United States as a new nation, uh, setting its western border at the Mississippi River. Uh, it gave Florida back to Spain and gave the French 
uh, several colonies in America, in Africa, excuse me, and the Caribbean. Uh, after the Treaty of Paris, this is a map of what everything looked like after the Treaty of Paris. Um, as you can see, there's that Mississippi right there. Um, you can see just right at Mississippi, right just above Louisiana was that, uh, was the, uh, border of the new United States of America. All right, moving on. Uh, women, uh, they helped to make clothes from material grown in the new world. They acted as nurses on the battlefield and did not gain many political or legal rights as a result of the war, but won respect for their roles as Republican mothers. Uh, the American Indians, um, many uh, tried to stay out of the war. Uh, some sided with the Americans and would later uh, punish other American Indians for supporting their enemy. Uh, some sided with the British with hopes of protecting their lands uh, from in, in, encroaching uh, Americans. Um, African Americans. Um, uh, Americans wanted independence, yet maintained slavery. Uh, Crispus Attucks was the first man American killed for the cause of the revolution. After the war, many demanded freedom using petitions and suing their owners in court. About 5,000 African Americans joined the war effort with the promise of freedom. Uh, 50,000 slaves, Southern slaves joined the British forces uh, the war led to emancipation in the North, but only increased in the South. Uh, that concludes our uh, lecture for the day. Um, I remember, you can always contact me through these platforms, my email, as you can see, my work phone, my, which is my desk phone, and my classroom phone. You will have to leave a message on my classroom phone, but I will check, I check those that message daily, but Remind is the best option to get in contact with me. So if you are not already signed up for Remind, go on to the, uh, the uh, uh, CTLS, uh, CTLS homepage and get that done because that is very important. Uh, and just remember, you if you want to email me, uh, if you email me after 3.30, more than likely you won't be emailed back to the next uh, work day, which would be um, if it's Friday, it would be Monday. All right. And of course, if you need tutorial, or you want to go over something again for any reason, always remember, make that appointment with me. Uh, send me a remind, uh, uh, email, and we'll set up a tutorial time for you between uh, the hours of 8 a.m. and 1.30 on Wednesday. All right. Thanks, everybody.